spiritually, separation from God. And then the third lie, you will be like God. And uh, again, there's a half truth here. You will be like God, knowing um, good and evil. And as we have looked at is, uh, they did come to know evil. Okay? But they came to know it very differently than God knows it. So, so you're going to be like God, you're going to know evil. And God knows evil again from the outside. Okay? I don't need him to know it from the inside. God, God knows evil, I, I've used this illustration, like a surgeon knows cancer. He knows cancer from the outside. He can give you a you know, scientific and bio, you know, biochemical description of cancer. A person who has cancer has it from the inside. So um, this is a, it, it's very different. They were contaminated now uh, with sin. And then what we saw, we saw last week, the actual action. And uh, in verse 6 it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. And those are the three ways we saw that the devil tempts us. We went back and we were looking at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, and then we looked at the temptation of Jesus. He went after Jesus, the devil, the same way he went after Eve. And then you have the fall. So what we're going to look at for the next two weeks, I'm going to talk about the consequences of sin. So what, what, what are the results of, of sin entering into the world? And we can all, we're going to relate to this. Because it's, it's relevant to, you know, to our lives. So the first thing that I want you to notice is uh, we cover up. And they covered up, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So what happened here? Like we were in our, our life group last Thursday. I got some good, uh, some good information. We were talking about this. So they were embarrassed about something that they were never embarrassed about before, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's guilt here and there's shame. Now, I just want you to look, go, to, go back to chapter 2, verse 25. You just read this with me. It said, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Okay, so what happened, right, between having no shame and being naked, and then suddenly realizing that they're naked and feeling, uh, feeling shame? You know, if you think about it, because like, was nakedness a sin? Well, obviously it wasn't um, before, you know, sin entered the world. So what made them aware that they were naked? Disobedience? They had knowledge of evil, and suddenly they weren't looking at each other the same way, nor looking at their own bodies the same way that they were looking at it before they sinned. So in their, in their guilt, and again, what happens, lust comes in here, okay? And there's this sense of guilt, this sense of shame. So they cover up the body parts. Again, what they're covering up is they're, they're covering up the reproductive parts, okay? The sexual parts. They didn't cover up the ears. They didn't cover up their feet. Right? They didn't sew fig leaves off. You know, they, didn't, they didn't do, um, what's those camel suits that they wear? A, gir a girly suit? The, the military wears? What do they wear? What? Ghillie suit, right? You see ghillie suit, it's like, it's, it's green. They didn't, they didn't put ghillie suits on. What they, what they did was they covered up that part of them, okay, that sexual part of them. And so, so, so the innocency, right, was gone, and now they looked at one another's body, including their own body, and they looked at it with, with a sense of shame. And uh, the innocency was... Just simply, it was, it was removed. So then there's, there's this sense of that something is, is wrong. And what you have here is they cover up. They cover up their nakedness. And um, that's something we've been doing since Adam and Eve. And I'm not talking about your clothes. We cover up our nakedness. We know there's something wrong, and then we cover it up. But just say, I heard it. We were here at a men's group, just like maybe three or four years ago. We have one of the New York Giants here with us. And uh, Tony, who was the guy who came in and did that? Lou Rassam. Lou Rassam was here with us. And he said something very profound. He, he, said, he, goes, he, he said, alcohol and drugs are um, basically fig leaves. And he said that it's a way that we cover up. Wow. And you think, think about this, because if you take, you take alcohol and drugs, what are they made from? They're made from leaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, again, it's, it's, it's a way of, you know, we, we, people bury themselves in, the, you know, in this stuff. And we cover, we cover up. Our pain, we cover up our sin, you know, by, by diving into, you know, into alcohol and drugs. Um, religion, 
is, is a fig leaf. Right? People, people, they basically cover up with religion. Remember when, when John the Baptist came and he's preaching and um, the Pharisees came up and they said, we are sons and daughters of who? Abraham. Of Abraham. They said, we're Jews. <laughs> and what did he say? He goes, well, you know, God, you know, if God wants, he could, uh, he could have the rocks, you know, to praise him. And essentially what, what he was saying is you're, you're hiding behind your religion. And your religion can't save you. You think you think that you're going to be saved, um, you're going to be righteous because you're a Jew. And he goes, God is concerned about what? He's concerned about the heart. And he's, he, hey, we get this in like, we get this in all the different brands of Christianity. I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. What do you what do you get in the Roman Catholic? I'm Catholic. I'm Roman Catholic. What do you do? You think when you're standing before God on Judgment Day? He's going to give a damn that you were Roman Catholic or an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian or anything else. What he's going to care about is your heart. And, and were you covered by the one, by the one thing that could cover you? Not religion. But religion, religion is a cover. There, there are the moral fig leaves. You ever see people with their, they, the, we, people invent or they essentially get caught up in some type of uh, moral code. And most of the time, it's, it's, it's an invention. You meet people like this all the time, and you, you, know, you talk with them, and uh, they have their little mini moral code. So, you know, I'm okay. You, know, you, you die, you think, you know, you, you think you're going to go to heaven. Well, I'm not such a bad person. Right? They, have their, they have their little moral code. Right? They're, they're, compared to who? So if you're going to compare it to Adolf Hitler, right, you're, you're like an angel. If you compare it to Stalin or, or to Mussolini, you're, you know, you're, you're in great place. But what if we compare it to Jesus? How are you doing there? Or what if we compare it to the, you know, do this all the time with people, to the Ten Commandments? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Well, have you ever lied? Yeah. I, mean, so I told you, I was talking to a girl, she says to me, oh, 10,000 times. She's saying, I'm, I'm fine. So have you, have you ever told a lie? And she goes, like, 10,000 times. Have you, have you ever coveted? Right? Have, have, you, have you ever stolen anything? Have you taken the Lord's name in vain? Have you, ever, have you ever put anything before God? An idol? You know, something material? And people start looking at that, right? But they will hide. We'll create these moral codes and we'll hide behind them because they, they, they somehow they, they, make us feel, they make us feel safe and we can kind of cover up our, our, our sin. So there's all sorts of fig leaves that people, that people will use to cover themselves. What is the only covering that we, that, that we have? Oh, Jesus. It's, it's, it's in Romans chapter 14, 13, I was reading this this morning, um, that um, we are to clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. Clothed with his blood, with his righteousness, with his death, with his resurrection. You know, that we, we need to be clothed with him. Or, or we stand completely, completely naked before God. So they covered up. They use fig leaves. And by the way, you, you, you go out in the world and you see people with fig leaves. And you see some of the worst fig leaves, the fig, fig leaf wearers are the people in the church. People in the church who haven't, they haven't come to a genuine acceptance and relationship with Jesus Christ. And they're just, they're just hiding in the church uh, you know, underneath a, a denominational la label. Or they'll, they'll, I mean, sometimes you get people, you know, they're quoting their pastor all the time. God don't care. When you stand before the Lord, he don't care what Pastor Frank said. What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with the blood of the Lamb? I don't care about you know, being, being a part of Living Word Community Church. What did you do with Jesus? He's the only one who can cover you. So they just fig leaves. And uh, so I don't need to sew fig leaves on. We've been sewing fig leaves on for these last thousands of years. Okay. Second thing they do is um, they hide, and we hide. So it says in verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. Now, I just want you to stop and look at that. He was walking in the, God, the, the, the garden. Does God have a body? Spirit. Right, God says in the scriptures, God is spirit, and we should worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm. So what you have here, um, and we see this occur uh, throughout the Old Testament. Understand this. Jesus, his incarnation, through the virgin birth, Jesus was incarnate. Okay, the incarnation was that God, okay, took on literally human flesh in the incarnation. So we, we say Jesus 
has a body. When Jesus was, was crucified, he was raised from the dead. He was raised with a glorified body. Jesus has a body. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. We will be able to see him, touch him, hug him, right? We're, we're going to be able to experience him. But um, just looking here again, in the Old Testament time, the incarnation hadn't happened. So, you know, people there, by the way, there's heresies out that say God the Father has a body. God the Father doesn't have a body. God the Father is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. And Jesus, the, the Logos, was, was spirit. So um, you have here what is called a theophany. And that's a fancy word. Theos means God. It, it, it's an appearance, it, it, it's a, an appearance of God in the form of humans. Sometimes we, we have we call them Christophanies. And we have Jesus. Okay, uh, coming and appearing. So just ask you, where in the Old Testament, let's just take, just take the book of Genesis. Where in the, Old, in the book of Genesis do we see God appearing in a theophany? Right with Abraham, right? The, the, the three angels appear, and the angel in the middle was the Lord. That's one place. Where's another place? What? Abraham, Jacob wrestling, right, with the, with the angel of the Lord. It's a so theophany of Jesus, a Christophany. There's another place. There's another place in the, in the book of Genesis. What? Oh, boy, that's, that's a... Some people... I, I kind of believe that was, that was a theophany. Some, some scholars say it's not. That Melchizedek was actually um, a theophany of, of Jesus. So there's, a lot of the, there's a lot of difference in, in, in some very good scholars who disagree with that. I'll give you one other place, one other place in the book of, and most of you are not getting this, because she's one, not one, one of the more popular people in the book of Genesis. Hagar. Remember? The angel appeared, yeah, that's, that's angel of the Lord. That's a, a Christophany, that's a, a theophany of, of, of God appearing. So what, what you have here in this, in this picture, the man and his wife, and the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. And if he was spirit, you're not going to hear his feet on the leaves or you know, on the ground. So uh, he, he's walking, he's walking to the garden, and here's a cool thing. In fact, it's cool because it, it, it says it's cool in the cool of the day. You know what the word there for cool is? It's the word rach. Remember the word rach? That's the word spirit. And boy, that's that, it's never interpreted as spirit. It's always interpreted as cool. But could it be that the, the, it's just like kind of the presence of the Spirit at this time of the day, and there's just the, it's the presence of God, and the Holy Spirit is cool, right? When you when you experience the Holy Spirit, so um, the Holy Spirit, okay, the, the the cool of day, and it says, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they are they are covering up, and they're hiding. And what do we do in our sin? We hide from God. We hide from other people. We don't want people to know the truth about us. But honestly, think of it. How many of you, you would want to stand here right now and suddenly we flash up on the screen all of your sins, right? That, we want to keep that to ourselves. We want to keep that at least, at least keep it between us and God. So here, here's a, I want to read to you something. Go with me to, uh, keep your finger there, Genesis. But I want you to go with me to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John 3. And we'll pick up on verse 18. And then we'll go back, we'll go back to chapter 3. So in, in John chapter 3, verse 18... He who believes in him is not condemned. Okay, this, is Jesus. this is Jesus speaking. But he who does not believe uh, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is uh, the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. Why? Why do men hide in darkness? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And that is what Jesus is. He is the great exposer. So to, to, come to, to come to salvation, to God, you must come into the light, and he has to expose you and all your sins. 
And a person, oh, listen, if a person is hiding behind religion, if a person is hiding behind morality, or hiding behind whatever, that person's not going to want to come in and be exposed by the light. So he says, for, for everyone practicing, verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light. You know, that, that, you know it's understanding he who, who comes, um, essentially, he who does the truth, he who faces the truth about himself. He was willing to admit, look, I'm a sinner. I've sinned, I've sinned in many, many, many ways. I have fallen short of the glory of God. I am, I am worthy of hell for eternity. And, and that person who will face that truth, there, there's nothing in me deserving of God's eternal life or of his righteousness or of heaven. And, and if you're not willing to come to that place, right, you have to, you have to come into that. He who does the light, Okay, uh, but he who does uh, the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they have been done um, essentially in God. He's exposed. And it's there that that person then, and Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve are hiding. They're not willing to give. The light is shining upon them and they're hiding from it. They're, they're, they're sowing fig leaves on themselves and they're hiding amongst uh, the trees. Now go, go back with me to... Um, to Genesis chapter 3. So here, here they are hiding, and I want you to look at verse 9. What does the Lord do? Yeah, but, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? I always want to look at this, because there's a gentleness in the voice of the Lord. The gentleness here, where, you know, where are you? And uh, it, it's God seeking uh, sinful man. God seeking sinners, God pursuing sinners. You know, there's a there's a theologian. He, he used the term, and I, I think it's it's a good term. It, it, it's a, some people would think it's derogatory, but he calls God the hound of heaven. So you know, like a, like a hound chasing a fox. God pursues sinners. You know, I, I said this. I don't believe God sends people to hell. I believe He does everything to keep them from going to hell. I believe that people send themselves to hell. And you know, if you don't, you know, how far will God go to save a man or a woman from hell? Look at the cross. Look at all that he went through. Look at all of his suffering. Look at all of his pain. How far would he go to save a, a sinner, right, from hell? And he's a, he's, he's a, God, a, is a God who pursues people. So he, he asks this, where are you? Now we know this. He knows all things, Right? He knows the beginning from the end. He, he knew where they were, so he, he's, he's not here. He's not here wondering where you are. What is he trying to do here? He's, he, he's trying to get them to say, hey, you know, this is where I'm at. Or in other words, like, what, what is he saying? You know, where are you at in relationship with me? You know, where, where are you at spiritually? Where are you at, um, where, you, you know, your priorities? Where, where, where are you at in, in, in your life? Are you saved or are you unsaved? Are you on your way to heaven or are you on your way to hell? Right? It's a good question. You know, and it's a good question not only that he calls out and asks those who have been born once, but it's a word that he speaks to us who have been born twice. Where are you at tonight? With God. Where are you, where are you at with the Lord? And so verse 10 so he answered, Adam answers, and he says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because uh, I was uh, naked, so I hid. I just want you to, to see this. This is, it, it's so sad. In Exodus 33, 11, it says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend, and Moses would return to the camp, uh, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, uh, did not leave the tent. God would speak to Moses face to face. Adam had an intimacy and of, of, of the presence of God and relationship with God that far, that far was beyond anything that Moses experienced. Mm -hmm. And uh, the face-to-face the, the -face relationship that Adam had with the Lord, and now he's hiding. Why is he hiding? No, he's, he's, he's afraid. Why, because, why is he afraid? Because he knows evil. And he's experiencing the separation of sin, the judgment of sin, the pain of sin, the sorrow of sin, the guilt of sin, the shame of sin. And I think he's terrified because God said what? If you take of the fruit, what's going to happen to you? 
die. Yeah, he's thinking that maybe that the Lord is there to, to execute him. So he's got, he's got a good understanding about the holiness and the righteousness of God. What does he not understand about God? The grace of God. <coughs> You know, this is a, people, people hide from God because they don't understand the grace of the Lord. Listen to this passage. During the tribulation period, okay? At the beginning of the tribulation period in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 uh, through 17. Listen to this. It says, The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hide in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. So all hell is breaking loose on earth. Okay, you, you, have, you have, I mean, this is a, a, an unleashing of the, the, the wrath of God, the wrath of Satan, and the wrath of man on, you know, on himself. So they're, they're hiding, and they're hiding in caves, they're hiding in rocks, and they call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? You know, you get a picture there? Those are people that are completely under the control of who? Of Satan. They're hiding from God. <coughs> They're hiding from him. Because they have no understanding about his grace. No understanding about his love. No understanding about his mercy. So verse 10. Again, God. Um, Adam says, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I want to just tell you, just look at the words of Adam. I just want to tell you something. I believe Adam is full of it here. I believe he's full of it. I believe that um, he's terrified not because he's naked. He, he's terrified because he sinned. Naked, his realization of his nakedness, that's just an implication, that's a ramification of sin. But it was actually the sin that, that, he, that, that he is now terrified. He's terrified of the Lord because of that. You know, just the stress is people don't like the consequences of sin. We don't like the consequences. We don't like the consequences of our sins. Somebody does. But we, when we commit sin, we like the sin. Yeah, right? Sin, sin can be, right, what's to say, it can be enjoyable for, for a period, right, for a season. Oh. And so here's Adam. He, he enjoyed the sin. He didn't like the consequences. When you think about people, like, like people like, they like the drug. They like the alcohol, they like the sexual immorality, they like the lust, the idolatry, the materialism. They like it. They don't like the consequences. The, the addiction that follows, being controlled um, by a substance, um, being controlled by a, a sinful habit, the illness, the poverty, the emptiness, the guilt, the shame, the separation that comes from it. So it, he, he's just kind of full of it. He's full of it. Terrified. He's terrified because he sinned, not because he's naked. Now, I watched... I watch, when I said this name, I'm, I know I'm going to get moans from all of you. I watched a documentary on cable the other night of Anthony Weiner. Okay? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Alias Carlos, Carlos Danger. Okay? And um, I just wanted, this is what I picked up from, from this. He liked the sin. And this is before all this new stuff came out about him possibly being a pedophile. Just... But he, he liked the sin, and you could see it was like, this, this was something that's thrilling. It was an adventure. And he didn't like being caught. He didn't like the embarrassment. Uh, he didn't like, he got 5% of the, the vote in New York for the, uh, the mayoral election. He didn't like that, because he was, he was at one point leading until all this stuff you know, uh, hit. Um, and I'm sure right now he doesn't like being separated from his wife and his kid. But just the, the, the sin, they like. But it's, it is, listen, it, it, it's not, again, it's not the nakedness. The thing that puts them in fear is, is, is it's the sin. So in verse 11, and God said, who told you that you're naked? And that's a great, great question. And he says, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And I say this again, um, who told you that you were naked? And I said, it's, it's a great question. So who told him? But who told him that he was naked? Because we, we know this. There was nobody else there. Right? And, and, uh, so there was nobody else there. He didn't have neighbors. Nobody else existed, Adam and Eve. So who told you that you were naked? Who? Yeah. Right? His conscience. It came, it came, it came from within. 
He violated his conscience, and, and he's now his conscience is convicting him. And we get convicted, right, when we sin. Right? So when you sin, you may say, hey, you know what, I'm getting away with this right now. This is a lot of fun. You know what happens, though? The conscience, man, it comes back, and, and it builds, and it builds, and it has, it has a really bad effect. Unresolved guilt and shame causes disease, causes mental problems, causes outward relational problems, causes all kinds of issues. So he put them in hand, Ben, at the end, at the end you can ask questions. So um, just, that, I mean, it, it causes all kinds of, it causes all kinds of issues here. So he's, you know, he, he's, in, he's in a place, and who told you this? Well, it, it, it's, it's, flowing, it's flowing from within. I had a woman here years ago, it's a woman in her 60s, and she asked me, she says, Pastor, can I come and talk to you? I have something I need to confess to you. I said, sure. So she comes up and meets with me, and um, she says, when I was in my 20s, I lived out in Pennsylvania, and there was a man who lived downstairs, and he raped me. And she said that she turned the gas on. He would get drunk and he'd fall asleep. And she turned the gas on and killed him. And she'd been living with that for 40 years. And she said it's just like that she came to the church, and for the first time she heard about a God who would forgive her. She never heard about, she'd been in churches, but she never heard about that Jesus can forgive you of your sins. So I talked to her about, it. Paul killed people, Moses killed someone. And I said that God can forgive, God can forgive. Well, David, David killed his tens of thousands. <laughs> but um, just, you know, just the, the, the grace of God, she, she came to experience, and she actually became, she became a, a member here an active member before she um, she retired and moved on. But isn't that it's, it's such a such a I think living with, with that. So here, here, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? And it, it, this is like Adam. He had perfect fellowship with God, and now it's just shattered. And he just in a place, imagine just total peace, total calm, total serenity. Now there's sin and there's shame and there's guilt, and he's hiding from the presence of God. He's hiding from the fellowship of the Lord. And it's, again, it's a picture of us. What do we do? In our sin, we resist the fellowship of the Lord. We resist the Holy Spirit. So I want to I give you a word here, just in, in coming, I'm going to wrap up here in a minute. The word depravity. Have you ever heard the word depravity? Depravity is a big theological word. But the word depravity, most people say, well, depravity is sin. That's only half. That's, that's only one side of the coin. In, un in understanding depravity, depravity is the condition in which one is unwilling to honestly repent. It is, it is the, the condition where not only are you sinning, but you will not face the truth and be honest and transparent that you are, are, are sinning and you are, you are breaking God's commandments and you're, separa you're separated from God. And that's, that's the place where Adam and Eve are right now. They're, they're in a place of, of, of depravity. And um, they're just, again, they're experiencing all of the fullness of depravity, evil and guilt and separation and, and, and sin. And what they needed to do was instead of hiding, instead of covering up, uh, they needed to repent. But I think maybe they're, they're, they're thinking to themselves, maybe, you know, you know what, maybe we can cover up, maybe, we can have, maybe God won't see it. And I think that's what, that's what people think. So they, they, they essentially, they cover up and they hide. I'm going to show you one more thing tonight because there's five things that have kind of consequences. We'll look at the other two next week. The third thing they do is blame. So they, they cover up and they hide, and then they get into this, this blame game. So the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. So who's he blaming? No, he's blaming God first. I want you to see that. It's your fault. It's your fault. He, he, blames, he blames God, and he blames the woman that you put here with me. I just want to just say this to you about Adam. He could have said no, right? That's right. When she opened him the fruit, he could have said no, I'm, I'm not going to take it. When I, when I was a kid, um, all my friends started to smoke cigarettes, and I said no. And then uh, they started smoking weed, and I said no. And then they started drinking beer. And I said, yes. But I said no to two out of three. I didn't want to stand here and make them think I'm some kind of a holy roller here. Okay? But I said no to the weed. I never smoked a joint. I never smoked a cigarette. And um, 
when, they, when the beer came around at 16 years old, yeah, I, I drank the beer. So, um, but he could have said no. But here, what he does is he blames God. Listen, I, I want you to, to listen to this. You know that um, that's what a sinner will ultimately do. It's just like, you know when, when uh, like the, the, the world of a sinner collapses, it all comes down to it's ultimately God's fault. And I've watched people, i watched people, unrepented people approaching death, and they will blame God. They will blame God for, you know, for, for all the mishap, for all the sickness. They blame, they blame God for, you know, for everything. And, uh, and that's, that, that's exactly what, you know, what they're doing here. And it's really, it's really the, you know, the, the, the thing that is so horrible here, in one day, right, like one 24-hour period, Adam and Eve went from praising God to blaming God. Yeah. Just like that. And so, verse 13, And the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And what did the woman say? The devil made me do it. Remember Flip Wilson? Some of you have some of the young people say, Flip Wilson, who's Flip Wilson? <laughs> Go on YouTube, Flip Wilson. He was a funny comedian back in the, uh, in the 70s. And he used to dress up like this woman, Geraldine. And she was like a Playboy bunny. Remember that? <laughs> and he used to do, The devil made me do it. And, you know, it's just the devil didn't do it. He used to do this with this high-pitched voice. And that's what he does. What, what, is, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The devil did it. So she's, she's now she's self-justifying and she's shifting the blame to the devil. But she's basically playing the victim game. I'm a victim. The devil made me do it. Adam, I'm a victim. You put the woman here. It's your fault. It's the devil's fault. Again, I, I want to show you just to be free from depravity. And to come to repentance, watch, watch this. What you have to do, you have to remove yourself from the blame zone. And you have to move yourself into the blame-free zone. You have to remove yourself from the excuse zone. And you have to place yourself in the excuse-free zone.